is Lord. He is Lord. Amen. He is risen today from the dead. And I declare to you that he is my Lord. Yes. Only you can say for yourself if you know that he is your Lord. Many today want him as Savior, but they don't allow him to be Lord and Master. They want to be saved from the depths of despair, but then there is the call to let him be Master and Lord over your life. I believe unless the Lord speaks differently in the next few days that this is the end of our Don't Miss series. We have uh, had a good time. Uh, I pray you have. I know I have. Um, in this series, these last couple of months, and uh, we want to uh, be obedient to the Lord and move to where he is showing us to go next. Now, unless he says something different in the next few days, we will see. We may be not missing again next week. We'll see. But I do believe that this will be our last sermon from that series. So how appropriate today that I want to speak to you from the topic of don't miss the master. Don't miss the master. There's a word from the Lord found recorded in three of the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. You can take your pick today, Matthew 8, 23 through 27. Amen. I'm going to make you an active participant. Matthew 8, 23 through 27. Or you may pick Mark 4, 35 through 41. Amen. That's from Mark's perspective. As you stand to your feet, you may even choose Luke 8, 22 through 25. I gave you options. Amen. Same God. Same word. Somewhat different perspective. As I looked at these texts, basically the text reads to us today, Matthew 8, 23 through 27, Mark 4, 35 through 41, and Luke 8, 22 through 25. It reads, that day when evening came, Jesus saw the crowd around him and gave orders to cross to the other side of the lake. Then he got into the boat and his disciples followed him. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along in the boat. There were also other boats with him. As they sailed, he fell asleep. Without warning, the furious storm came up upon the lake so that the waves swept over the boat and it nearly swamped. They were in great danger, but Jesus was sleeping. He was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? Master, Master, save us, we perish. He replied, You have little faith. Why are you so afraid? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the waves. Quiet, peace be still. And the storm subsided immediately, and all was calm. The men were amazed and terrified, and they asked, What kind of man is this? Who is this that the winds and the waves, even the winds and the waves of the sea, obey him? So reads the words of the synoptic gospels put together from Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Lord, we thank you today. We ask that you bless us now. Give us preaching power in Jesus' name to say exactly what needs to be said. Help us not to miss the most important thing, and that is you, Master. Teach us today. Reach us. Talk to us. Make it plain, Lord, what you would have us to know. In Jesus' name, amen. 
You may be seated, but on your way down, tell somebody, don't miss the master. Don't miss the master. I preached this passage several times, and but today with the backdrop of this don't miss series, let us not miss, let us see who this master is. Songwriter says, I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea, he heard my despairing cry. And from the waters, he lifted me. Now safe am I. Another song says, when the storms of life are raging, stand by me. Thou who rulest wind and water, stand by me. And then Sister Sabrina turned some pages this morning and said, let the lower lights be burning. Send a gleam across the wave. Some poor fainting, struggling seaman. You may rescue, you may save. And then they used to say there's a storm out. Y'all ain't praying with me. On the ocean. And it's drifting this away. If your soul's not anchored in Jesus, you will surely, come on, drift away. Drift away, Lord. Drift away. You will surely drift away. If your soul's not anchored in Jesus, somebody knows what I'm talking about. You will surely drift away. Don't miss. Don't miss the mission. Don't miss the moment. Don't miss the model. Don't miss the mandate. Don't miss the mess. Don't miss the meeting. Don't miss the move. And don't miss the master. Jesus at the onset of this text, has been teaching all day. I have no idea what he went through, but I do know what it's like to somewhat teach all day. And when you pour yourself out and pour yourself into people and you really want them to get it, no matter if it's a sacred level or a secular level, you pour yourself out. Teaching is more than just babysitting. It is trying to reach someone. So not only has he been teaching, but he's probably been healing people. They have been coming at him in droves. He is in demand. And so as the crowds are pressing in on him, the question comes or, or the, the, the thing comes where he goes into a boat and goes over and says, let us go over to the other side. I hear God's word saying, let us come apart. Somebody has said that Jesus did this often. He went into the mountains to pray. He went down to the seashore. He got in the boat and went over to the other side. He knew he had a divine assignment that he did not want to miss, Deacon Piles, on the other side of the Sea of Galilee. If you were at Bible study, you heard about the demoniac of the Gadarenes. But on the way there, amen, they run into some trouble. I'm going to jump to the end of the text just for a moment. And I want to present this to you so you can be thinking about this as we travel through this. They get to the end of the ordeal, you saw the verse, and a question arises, 
What manner of man is this? Let's stop right there. I want to pose that question to you today. You came to church, amen? You've enjoyed the singing. You participated. You talked to people across the aisle. You heard the readings. You heard the prayers. You've been here. You knelt down at the altar. But at the end of the day, when church is over, when service is done, when you go home and you're by yourself or you're with your own thoughts, the question must come to mind, who is this Jesus to me? What manner of man is this? Who is this man? What kind of man is it that even the wind and the waves will obey him? We must all come to this question and we must settle it in ourselves. Let me pause and just remind you, I can't settle it for you. Grandma can't settle it for you. Your Sunday school teacher, your spouse cannot settle it for you. This question, this question is personal and it must be settled between you and the master. While I'm there, let me remind you and tell you who he's not. Amen. He's not. The man upstairs. I said that in Bible study. He's not just a good man. He's not just some great prolific teacher that can be coupled in a group with Ptolemy and, and, and all these other great philosophers and Confucius and all these famous people that were intellectuals. Jesus is more than just a prolific teacher. He's not an amazing historical figure that can be grouped in with George Washington and Dr. King and, and Gandhi and Harriet Tubman. He's not just a historical figure. He is not just lovey-dovey Jesus or as one person called him, sissy Jesus that is just a loving savior that has no might, has no power, just wants everybody to love. Somebody even said he's not just condoning Jesus that is willing to condone your sin and let you wallow around in it while he loves and hugs on you. He is the awesome God. Of the universe. He spoke all things into existence. Scientifically, I cannot wrap my mind around that. I can't wrap my mind around how he made and spoke a star into existence. That means light came flying out of his mouth at 186 thousand miles per second and the Bible says and he spoke it and it was yeah. Yes. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. John the revelator tried to describe what he saw and in Revelation 19 11 and verse through verse 16 here's what he said and I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse yeah. Yeah. and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were a flame of fire and his head he wore many crowns and he had a name written that no man knew but himself and he was clothed, he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies, somebody in here is going to be in that army, mm -hmm. which were with him from heaven, followed him upon white horses, and they were clothed in white linen and clean, and out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. He treadeth the winepress of the fierceness of his wrath of almighty God. And he hath on his vesture, on his garment, and written on his thigh is a name written, King of Kings 
and Lord of Lords. That's the Jesus I'm talking about. He's not a doormat. He's not somebody sitting in the corner just waiting to be called on. He is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Don't miss the master. Check the text and let's see who this master is. The first thing that I noticed in this text, and I preached this, as I said, several times, but, but with this backdrop, it, was just, it just came out new to me. This master I'm talking about, he orchestrates your voyage. Praise God. Catch that, catch that, catch that. He gets you on the boat. Boat, metaphorically, would represent your life. Amen. Catch this. You travel, you, you board, and notice this, the disciples did that. It, it's a process, and your survival, it depends on you being on the boat. But Jesus got on the boat. They got him on the boat. He got on the boat. And the Bible says that they followed him and then they go out to sea. Notice this. If he is God, and he is, then you believe with me that he is omniscient. Which means he knows everything that's already been. He knows what's going on right now. And he knows what's going to happen in the future. So before he stepped foot in the boat, he already knew there was a storm a coming. Yet, he got in the boat. He orchestrated the voyage. Notice it says in Matthew's account, he entered into the ship and the disciples followed him. That means they joined, they attended with him, they accompanied him. I'm reminded of what the word of God says, that the steps of a righteous man are ordered by God. So the Lord will orchestrate storms and then you follow him in to those storms. From the moment Jesus called these disciples, he knew a stormy moment would happen. Amen. I thought about this. If the folks getting on the Titanic would have known it was going to sink, they wouldn't have got off. Hello, somebody. But somebody told them even God can't sink this ship. Had they known, had they had the wherewithal to understand that the boat was going to sink, That'd have been an empty boat. If these disciples would have known that this storm was going to rise as it did, most of them, like you and I, I ain't getting on that. <laughs> Let somebody tip you off about what's going to happen and you avoid stuff like the plague. Well, I heard that this was going to happen. I heard that they were going to be there. I heard that it might go. And people will navigate clear. I'm not getting. You know folks in water, by the way, anyway. <laughs> uh -uh, come on, sister. I'm scared of water. I, I don't know. I don't get. They're the ones at the pool sitting 40 feet back. They don't even want splash, let alone get on a boat that could potentially go down. Are y'all here with me? You understand? So they had no idea that the storm was coming. As I said a few weeks ago, they were in it for the cruise. He wants to get away. The crowds are pressing. They are pressing in on him. Let's go to the other side. Who doesn't want to take a cruise? But if you know along the way that a storm can come up out of nowhere, you'll potentially not get on the boat. God orchestrated every single person to be on that ship. Stick with me. I'm going somewhere. Jesus will not take you where he can't keep you. 
I wish just two people would get that down in their spirit today. I don't know where you've been in life. I don't know what you've gone through. I, I'm not sure about all the things that could have happened. But I want you to be reminded wherever you are, the Lord will not take you where he cannot keep you. Keeps you by his grace and his mercy. Surely his goodness shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord. The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is with me and he walks with me. He walks along beside me. He will not take you through something that he intends to not go with you through that. He knew who would be on the boat and they followed him. So while I'm in my hymnologist mode this morning, I hear the old saint sing. We might be doing a hymn Sunday. Get ready, Sister Sabrina. Where he leads me, I will follow. I'll go with him through the garden. I'll go with him through the trial. I'll go with him. I'll go with him. He says, Christian, follow me. When I used to hear that song, I said, I thought they were singing to me. No, he's singing to disciples. Will you get on the boat even if you know a storm can come? Christ orchestrates the exact spot when the Doppler radar goes off. You see, the disciples did not have the benefit of these. They did not have a weather alert coming up. They did not have Tony Cavalier call ahead and tell them, don't go sailing today. All they had was Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What are you trying to tell me, Pastor? I'm telling you, the Lord orchestrates the idea that a storm comes your way so that you can see, really, who he is. Darrell and I had this conversation. You didn't know how that blessed me as I was sitting there. I was trying to read over this. We were talking about fate. And again, my mind began to go back to that poem in 10th grade that our 10th grade English teacher told us to learn. It is called Invictus. I don't re remember who the writer is, but at the end of the poem, it says, I am the master of my fate or the captain of my fate. I'm the master of my soul or I'm the master of my fate and the captain of my soul, I believe, is how it, 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 it rings. But get this, you are not the captain. That's right. You're not even the first mate. Gilligan <laughs> you are not over your fate you're not in control of your destiny the Lord has you to get on boats when he knows that there'll be some choppy water but once again it makes all the difference when you know who the master is you see my friends my sisters and brothers Safety is not the absence of trouble, but the presence of the Lord. Amen. Safety is not the absence of trouble. We, we've all gone through our lives where we thought, I just want to be safe. People leave me alone, not have any problems, not have any struggles or trials. But that's not the point. The point is that when Jesus is with you, doesn't matter what comes your way. Many want to live a trouble-free life. Some preachers have told them that's possible. You won't hear that to hear, hear that to hear at Pain Creek. I'm, I heard what Job said. Job said, man born a woman is few days. Means life short and full of trouble. Anybody found Brother Job to be correct? Man born a woman is a few days and full of trouble. God did not promise you a trouble-free life, but he did promise he'd be on the boat with you. And you can be with him. Two painters were in a contest and said they could paint a true picture of peace. 
One painter painted a serene sunset with the sun going down over icy or blue water and it looked very nice and the picture had a calming effect. The other painter painted one of a storm. People looked at his picture and in it the sky is dark and the lightning is flashing and the thunder is rolling and the waves are crashing against the rocks on the shore. Things look very chaotic. But down in the corner of the painting, at the bottom, nestled between two big rocks, is a bird. And the bird is sitting on the nest, and the bird has its mouth open and it is singing. And he said, now that is peace. What are you saying, preacher? What I'm trying to tell you is, it's easy to have peace on a sunny day. It's easy to have your things all in line when the Lord allows the sun to shine down on you and everything is going well. But when the storms of life are raging, can you still sing? Because you know you're surrounded by the rock of ages. Amen. Cleft for me. Let me hide myself. In thee. You see, peace is having knowledge of the master and where he leads you, you are willing to follow. We, my sisters and brothers, must get to the point that we realize the conductor, the captain, the one over our lives, he knows what he's doing. And that takes me back to the first thought of what I said. Many people want him to be savior. But then they don't allow him to be Lord. They don't allow him to be master. They want to wrestle the reins of control or, or keep a hold of him. I, I'll say it one more time. You're not the captain. It's not a two-seater. you got to let the Lord have control and trust. 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 He knows what he's doing. Do you believe that today? Do you believe when he asked you to get on the boat of insecurity when you believe? Do you believe when he asked you to get aboard the boat that could potentially go down? Do you believe that when he asked you to go with him wherever he's going, he knows the way and the path? The disciples quickly found out that the master has a way of orchestrating into the storm into trouble amen the disciples quickly find out that they are in trouble and they are in a dire situation not only them but if you read the account in, in mark there were other ships with them amen cue the music it does say in the music and if not for the courage of the fearless crew I'm dating myself. It's okay. The minnow would be lost. Some of y'all still, you'll get on the way home. Just turn on TV land. You'll find Gilligan and Skipper and Ginger and Marianne. If not for the courage of the fearless crew, the ship would be lost. But that's, that's not an apply to this text today. This crew was fearful. They, were, they weren't fearless, they were fearful. So the second point I want to bring you is not only does the master orchestrate in the storm, but the master is at home in the storm. <laughs> Hallelujah to the Lamb. The master is at home in the storm. How can you say this, Pastor? How can you say this, preacher? Because the text says Jesus was asleep. In all of this. Yeah, yeah. Now I've had this happen. I have. I've had people say boy. Wasn't that a storm last night. And I'll get up and see it. People posting about it. On the on the, the social media or whatever. And, and even maybe somebody in our house. Said, Did you hear that last night. And But then I'm like. What storm. Yeah. I was out. I didn't hear a thing. Amen. Somebody's a sound sleeper. I'm 
feeling somebody really strong on this side of the room. But then there's other times that the storm wakes me up. And I see the moment that lightning flashes in the distance and I hear the wind pick up in our house. It has a way of whipping around that side there between Miss Althea and myself. And, and it, it keeps you, it rings, it rings. It even sings and it keeps you up. But now, this is another element. They're not in a house. They're in a boat. So in your house, you can stand on solid land. Amen. Should be solid. You, should, you can stand on the floor. You can go to the inner part. But here, they're exposed. They're out in the boat. This wasn't some big cruise ship with windows and things. It was wide open. And underneath of them is churning. And over top of them is churning as the water comes over the side. And the crew was fearful. You have to understand this lake this Sea of Galilee is 150 feet deep on average, almost 200 in spots. On either side of it, it has peaks or hills. One side, I believe, the east side is around 2,000 feet high. That would be almost three times, four times higher than the peaks across that you look at at West Virginia. And it, that, that air that lifts up into the mountains, you know, the higher you go up in altitude, it gets colder. But then the cold air lifts and then cold air will also fall. What happens is that humid air on the sea and on the lake mixes with that cold air. And as that air whooshes down, it creates a storm out of nowhere. To top it all off. This lake, this sea, if you will, is not as deep. So therefore, the water becomes even more turbulent because the energy is not dissipated in the deep water. These disciples had seen storms. They are experienced fishermen. But this one was different. Yet, Jesus, with all of that, is sleep. Think about it. He sleep in the bow of the ship. I'm thinking about this text. Didn't he get wet? Didn't he feel the wind? Didn't he hear the rumble of the air and the thunder and whatever else? Did he not experience this? No, the Bible said he was sleep. Now, I get it because... Sometimes you can be so tired, you are literally sleep dead to the world, so to speak. You hear nothing. We already established that. But this again is on a boat. Didn't he feel the rocking? Didn't he hear the water sloshing around him? Have you ever stepped, slept through a storm? The wind is literally almost rolling the ship. And the waves are coming over the side. And then to top it all off, I know folks, I know folks are hollering. I'm trying to picture y'all on this boat. I can almost say the first five that would be screaming and hollering. This is not the sermon today, but... but I can almost see it. Come on, help me. My, my, my sense of humor here. Somebody, you know, people deal with things in different ways. Somebody's hollering at somebody else because they didn't do something fast enough that they didn't get to do. Or they didn't do it right, but you're all in panic mode. Oh, my goodness. I, don't make me talk about my family. And y'all got some in your family, too. Can you picture the disciples? Hurry up! Get the bucket. Hurry up. Dip it over. You're not going fast enough. Don't you see? And they're standing there going in circles, yelling and screaming. They were experienced. And with all that going on, Jesus is. He sleep. Let that sink in. He's in the back of the boat. He's sleep. 
I thought about this. When I'm home, I'm comfortable. When I'm home, I'm comfortable. When I go away, I enjoy going away. I like going here and going there, but I'm always glad. Come on, Dorothy had it right. There's no place like home. Y'all hear me? Jesus is at peace. Hallelujah. In the storm. He is at home. In the storm. He is sleeping. He is not worried at all. Why? Because he's the master. He's the master of the sea. They're panicked. They're experienced fishermen. He's a carpenter's son. They've been out on the water. He's sawed and hammered. He's built things. He's a carpenter's son. They are panicked and here is this carpenter's son sleep. Jesus is at home. He's at peace. And here's the, here's the disciples. Catch this. Somebody needs to hear this. Many times our reaction to the situation is worse than the situation itself. I'm preaching to me. You can say amen if you want to. Many times how we view and, and look at the situation and, and worry about the situation. I want to know, y'all know me, the spoilers, the, the cliff notes. I got to know how to head, Lord. I, I can't take all this. You got to let me know what's going to happen. And all the while Jesus is saying, if you're with me and I'm with you, you can be at home and in peace. You can be that bird singing with your mouth open because you know who the rock is. Jesus was at home in the storm. His disciples are fearful of the circumstances coming their way. And you can't teach a lesson to somebody if you're lacking in knowledge you can't help the rest of the class. There's no need for me to stand up Tuesday whenever we go back to school and try to tell them about Newton's laws if I don't know anything about Newton. If I think his first name is Fig, that's then we're already all in trouble. Sir Isaac is who I'm talking about. I can't tell them that distance equals time times rate if I have not studied it for myself and know it myself. I can't teach them something I don't know. And if I do, I will teach them something incorrect. So let me fix your theology. Why was Jesus sleep in the boat? Because he knew exactly what the wind was. He made it. He knew what the sea was. He made it. He knew about the lightning. He made it. He knew the mountains. He made them. He made the disciples. He made the wood the boat was made out of. He knows H2O. He breathed it out of his mouth. He's the master. How do you know this? Because I know God's word. They did not know fully who he was. But he's God. Look what John says later. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things made were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life and the light was the light of men. Jesus made it all. He made it all. He spoke it into existence. So why should he be doubtful of something that he was creator and master over? Storms and trials, my friends, my sisters and brothers, hear this, are designed to give you a bigger view of who God is. And you thought you went through it because you've done something wrong. You, you thought you went through it because you haven't always done it this way. But I'm allowing you to know 
that the trial, the test, the working of your faith, the storm that you can go through is designed so that you may have a bigger view of this God. Coincidentally, when your faith shrinks, your fear increases. I want to warn somebody this afternoon that shrinking faith leads to increasing fear. Yet on the flip side of this coin, when fear shrinks, your faith increases. Now, I had a discussion just a few moments ago, and Jesus said that if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can move mountains. So you don't have to have a big mountain of faith. You just have to have a little faith. And watch this. Jesus can work with you. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. These disciples don't see a way out of this mess. They were trying to get the water out of the ship. They have a fear of sinking. Listen to the words. Master, don't you care that we perish? They did not know. They did not fully understand. This is for somebody that the ultimate life preserver was on board with them. I hear Isaiah say, Lord will keep you in perfect peace when your mind is stayed on him. So the disciples put the buckets down. <laughs> Stop screaming at one another. Amen. I'm putting in a Christian commentary. Stop running around and somebody gets smart and decides to ask the master. That's us, church. That's us. We got folks in the boat. Let me handle it. I got it. I can do it. I'm in control. I'm the master of my faith. Give me the bucket. You don't know how to get it out. We got folks that will holler and will scream and will cry and complain. And then somebody says, well, let's pray about it. Let's not fret ourselves. The Bible says don't, don't fret. It says do not be afraid. 365 times. Have you, have you thought in your situation? Go to Jesus. You see, the problem is, church, we many times get into trouble and we make him our last resort. We make him our last option. But see, priority should teach us that he needs to always be first. We want him to be first when it's time for a blessing. We want him to be first when it's time for this and for that. But when you get into trouble, call on him. He is more than I'm an in trouble, God. I'm an in trouble, Jesus. Come to me when it's a last resort. He wants you to come to him on calm days. Make it a routine. Make it a habit when it's a day like today and the sun is shining. Come on, y'all hear this. And there's nothing going on in your life. Everything, you're on easy street. That's when you should be on your knees. Because then it is not breaking of habit. But it is a habit that you've gone to the master first. I'm finished, but I want to close out and tell you this. What else do you know about the master? He not only orchestrates us through the storm and in to the storm. He's not only able to do a seating above, above what we can ask or expect, but the master here, he is more than enough for your problem. He's not only at home in the storm, but he's the answer to your storm. Look at this. That word master, they call him that, meaning he's preeminent. He's the one who shows the way. When you get on this cruise of life with Christ, notice this, this cruise with him, 
is an all-inclusive cruise. Y'all will get this on the way home. That means everything he is, you get the benefit from having him in the boat with you. By this point, the disciples had already observed Jesus speaking to people. They have observed him healing people. They have observed him uh, speaking to his father. They had observed all these things. And yet in this dire moment, they don't understand who he is. Listen to what he says to them. And then catch this. He says, where is your faith? He's saying that to us today. Yes. Where is your faith? Who has your faith? What are you trusting in? And we need to be reminded we have to put our faith solely and totally in Christ. But some folks get caught up in trusting the boat, trusting their experience, trusting in luck, trusting in others, trusting in all these other things. When the first one you should trust is Jesus. Amen. Catch this. Notice this. Jesus had to calm them down before he calmed the storm. Amen. What's that say? What does that say to us? The wind and the waves know their place. But us, we another issue. The deacon said it. Y'all are a mess. And so am I. We, have, we got problems. Yeah, yeah. He had to calm the disciples down before he stepped out and spoke to the wind and the waves. That needs to be addressed in our churches. Amen. The Lord needs to be the one that gets us Focus and calm in these turbulent and rough and choppy waters of the times that we live in. I've never seen it like this before. People are being tossed like a, like a ship that's tossed and driven, battered by an angry sea. But there is a Savior that wants to calm you. Don't miss the master, my friends. Don't miss what he says. He says, peace. Be still, which in the original language, if you look at it, it is he is speaking specifically and not a personification, but literally to the storm. And he says to the storm, get this, be muzzled, which means to put something over the mouth of something else. Many theologians think this storm had more than just a natural perspective, but that it was a demonically charged storm. It doesn't matter what type of storm it was, Jesus can speak to anything and it comes under control. So who has the mastery? Who has mastery over these things? Jesus. Notice as he speaks peace, he has master over the vessel because he's asleep in the very ship that could sink. He has master over the sea that is the depths of the waves. He has mastery over the elements. He has mastery over the calamity and the pending sinking of the, sh of the ship. And then catch this. He has master over his doubting disciples. He has mastery over them. He is more than enough. For your situation. Catch what the text shows us. It is here as clear as day. Jesus is asleep. He's tired. He's flesh. But he speaks to the elements. He's God. He is the one, the only true son of God from heaven. How can we miss this? That is why the disciples said, what kind of of man is this you've got to come to that realization do I fully know him or not do I fully understand who he is or not is he everything to me that the scriptures say or have I just been in the ship 
with no knowledge of who he is. You see, it is possible to be in the boat, but not know the captain. And then when the storm comes, it forces you to reevaluate your doctrine. Mm. The world, my friends, sisters, and brothers, is taking on water. It's capsizing. The world is sinking. The winds of change are blowing. There is a spirit of antichrist that is prevalent all around us, and the storms are intensifying. I don't care what anybody says. It's not going to get better. Scripture says so. There is, as we said earlier, a storm out on the ocean. Yet Christ beckons us to know who the master is. God allows storms. Anybody a witness to that? God allows shakeups. God allows these things, I hear my mother tell me that, to come into your life so that you may trust him more. Oh, for grace to trust him. Anybody found that out? Tis so sweet. Not to trust in who I am. Not to trust in what the pastor is. Not to trust in these four walls. Not to trust in your degrees or your bank account or your expertise. But tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. You see, storms will quickly expand your knowledge of who Jesus is. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You've come through some things and you can look back now and hindsight is 2020 and you can say after I've come through this, I know better who he is than I did before it. So even though the storm came and it took something out of me, even though the storm came and it hurt me along the way, I know who Jesus is now and I trust him even more. Storms will test your doctrine as to who and what manner of man this is. You see, my life, my friends, sisters, and brothers, is much like these men on this boat. My life was sinking. I was without hope. Anybody else in here with me? We were fellows on the same ship. What, what ship are you talking about, preacher? I'm talking about the ship of sin, the ship of hopelessness. The Bible says, for all have sinned and fallen short. You have sunk in your sins, fallen short of the glory of God. But there is an anchor. There is a savior. There is one who has come to lift you out of sin. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ, our Lord. He is the Savior. He is the master of the sea. So what kind of man would come down through 40 and two generations? What kind of man would see who I would be? See who you are and still decide to die on the cross of Calvary? What kind of man would give his life for a wretch such as I? What? 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 kind of man would come and lay down his life for his friends. I'm telling you who this man is. His name is Jesus. Some call him Savior. Some call him Master. Some call him the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. I call him Jesus. He is my rock. He is my Savior. He is my life preserver. He is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He is everything that I have need of. Praise the name of the Lord. Have you found out in your life, church? Don't play with me that you can hold on to him and he will hold on to you in the storms of life. What manner of man is this 
that even the winds and the waves obey him. What manner of man is this that even the grave cannot hold him? You and I are subject to death, hell, and the grave. But God sent, God sent a Savior that is not subject to death, not subject to hell, not subject to the grave. How do you know this, Pastor? Because he beat death. He beat hell. He beat the grave when he rose early on that third day. He got up early on that third day. While it was still dark, he rose with all power in his hands. What manner, what manner, what manner of man is this? He is the one that's coming back to receive the church unto himself. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. You'll get to spend eternity finding out what manner of man this is. Don't miss the master. Don't miss this opportunity. I would hate to spend a lifetime in church and hear countless sermon after sermon after sermon and still miss on who Jesus is. Oh, this church is special to me. This church is special to me because I'm reminded that I was baptized right here under this floor. I, I remember singing in the little youth choir here and playing the piano up against the wall, but my mom said to me one day, she said, Christian, I wanted to be sure. I, I wanted to know that you really hadn't just walked down the aisle. You really hadn't followed the crowds. You really hadn't done something that you didn't know what you were doing, but that you knew exactly who Jesus is. There is a truth in knowing that you can attend church, but not be in the church. You can be in fellowship, in the boat, but not know the captain. So I'm challenging you this afternoon. Don't miss the master. He is calling people. He is speaking to people. He is saying, come to me while I, you may be found. Come to me, run to me while I am seeking the lost. Come to me before it's everlasting too late. Yes. Don't miss the master. As you stand to your feet, it is a challenge today not to be in church, not to be on the roll. Amen. Not to be a part of something. This is not a Sam's Club. But to be saved. I hope you hear me. I'm, I'm serious. The Lord is not a plaything. You got to know that you know that you know you are saved. One of these days, all preaching is going to be over. All singing is going to be over. All church attendance like this is going to be over. And when you stand before the master of the sea, when you stand before the one that I read about that John said in Revelation 19, his eyes were aflame. And in his thigh is written, King of kings and Lord of lords. His vesture is dipped in blood. When you stand before him, what will your explanation be? What will he say to you? Yes. It's serious. Don't just come and not know. Don't just get on the boat and not know who he is. I'm thankful for the disciples. I'm thankful that the Lord, through the unction of the Holy Spirit, placed that question in Scripture. What manner of man is this? It screams to us 2,000 years later. Do you know the man? Do you know him in the free pardon of your sins? We have too long categorized him as somebody 
that is just able to just do some things for us. He's he's a prayer answering God. Let me tell you, he's not only a loving God. He's not only a forgiving God, but he is a God of wrath and he will judge sin. Amen. This man or a man I'm talking about has the power to forgive you of your sins. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Saved from what? Saved from sin. Sin is the separator. And there is a penalty. Mr. Qualls just celebrated his 85th birthday, 86, 87. Let me add two years. Thank you. He always says to me when I talk to him, preachers don't preach about hell anymore. Preachers don't preach about going to hell anymore. There's a lot of them who are not. There's a lot of them that give you cotton candy gospel. But the full gospel is this, understanding completely that when you reject Christ, you accept hell. I do not want you to leave from this place today without understanding to reject the Savior's free gift of salvation is to say, I want an invitation into eternal darkness forever. I've made it as plain as I can. Jesus has given us the way to salvation. There is a penalty for accepting or not accepting his free gift. Do you know the man? Do you know the master? Is he the master over your situation? God, we thank you. We bless your name in this place. You are the master of the sea. We thank you that you still hear despairing cries. So if there is someone here today that is crying out for you, and maybe they just don't know how, they don't want to know, people to know, but Lord, I know that you can hear their cries. And even where they stand, even where they sit, maybe they're watching online, you can save even now. Help them to know the truth of your word, that you want none to be lost. You want none to perish, but that all come to the knowledge of repentance and salvation. Lord, help them to turn from sin and towards you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.